Welcome, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of Meet Your Neighbor. I'm here at the home of artist and sculptor Michael Alfano, and this is also the site of his studio. Many people in the United States, uh, throughout the world, know Michael as a famous sculptor, um, as do the people of our town of Hopkinton. And not as many know him as neighbor, and this uh, interview gives us an opportunity to hear a little bit more about his life story. Um, so I grew up in Queens Village, uh, New York, in New York, part of New York City, um, and then later moved to uh, East Meadow, Long Island. Um, actually, I wasn't doing a lot, uh, any art back then, wasn't an artist until after college, so I spent a lot of time um, reading, uh, playing trumpet, and um, doing a lot of camping with the scouts. I ran track, uh, did a lot of bike riding, and um, you know, sort of fun stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what would you say nurtured your early artistic roots in uh, where you grew up? Uh, probably more than anything else, the library. Spent a lot of time um, reading and finding books and sort of exploring in the library. Um, playing chess and, you know, sort of, I guess, thinking outside of the box and solving chess problems and, you know, figuring out how to get an advantage in, in mm -hmm. playing chess. Um, and it, I think it, when I went to college, I did some study at, um, in, um, as an exchange student in Denmark where things were taught from the periodicals and um, answers were, tests were always in essay format as opposed to multiple choice questions. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of my first real taste of, um, you know, sort of thinking real thoughts as opposed to multiple choice answers. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, and, and, doing that program in um, Denmark and also I did a high adventure program with the scouts sort of got me you know thinking more along the lines of you know excellence and striving to um, create something amazing and do something amazing um, which is you know where I've kind of tried to gear my life on sort of after the sort of school experience. Um, just one more thing uh back in the childhood days um, in terms of uh, being an artist. Uh, mm -hmm. did, were you dabbling in the arts back then? Uh, yeah, your, uh, your sculptures I, I are wasn't. amazing how you can <laughs> represent so much in them, not only the physical appearance of people, but uh, you get to deeper things. Uh, right. Um, I, I wasn't really doing art per se. I you know, was doing some uh, wood projects, mm -hmm. you know, sort of building wood shelves and models and things like that. Um, I, I think a, a lot of the sort of deeper things came from the literary background of just reading tremendous amounts of books. I was studying finance. I was in the business school at what SUNY Albany, Albany, which is the State University of New York in Albany. And uh, there's Probably not a lot of creativity in that program. Uh -huh. um, well, again, I um, took concurrently with my business classes, also took English classes mm -hmm. and was studying, doing a lot of um, English stuff, um, which was, you know, I guess the, the business side was sort of the fear of getting a job and the parents saying, you know, you've got to get something that will pay the bills. And the English side of it was just more the love of it. And because I wasn't an English major, I was a, a business major, I didn't have to take the required English classes. I could basically just pick and choose of whatever I wanted. So, um, you know, I had Native American literature and African American and women's studies and um, uh, psychology and literature. So I got really a very wide, broad-based um, uh, background in 
literature and English and sort of on the periphery, not so much the mainstream. In other words, mm -hmm. I actually never took a, uh, like a Shakespeare or um, uh, old English literature classes, which are sort of the required mm -hmm. classes. I, again, yeah, it kind of was on the periphery. Mm -hmm. And were you writing? Doing some I was writing. Um, I did some, I did a uh, play and a number of short stories, a, a lot of um, poetry uh, back then. And, um, you're still writing poetry now? Um, well, I have it in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, um, you know, in college it worked well because there wasn't a lot of time to, it was sort of a creative outlet without sort of needing a lot of time and so on a little scrap of paper I could jot something down and get out what I want to say um, and now sort of focusing on the sculpture it's sort of like a, a giant poem let's say um, and so it's um, maybe more like a novel where I'm not doing a lot of the little stuff but you know much larger sort of projects. Mm -hmm. um. And uh, were you studying history and philosophy in college, or was that something you think came out of the English? Because that's something you see in, in your sculptures as well. Um, I, I did a little bit of philosophy, um, and actually quite a bit of psychology, mm -hmm. um, and then sort of the business classes, and um, as well as doing, again, a study abroad program in Denmark, um, which was just really wonderful, and got me a chance to be able to travel through Europe um, quite extensively. And this was during the period of the 1989 and 1990 when the Berlin Wall was coming down. Mm -hmm. So it was a very traumatic time in Europe, at, you know, then. Um, we were able to travel in um, Eastern Europe, which had basically just opened up. Um, we actually did a lot of hitchhiking through Europe um, into Yugoslavia, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, um, again, Eastern Germany, Western Germany, um, and other places like that, down to Italy. Mm. How um, long a period, a half a year? Or whole uh, year? It was a half a year, mm. so, um, about, yeah, six months or so, mm -hmm. from January to June. And then the following summer, I went back to um, do an, an exchange scout program, and that was in um, Cyprus, Greece. So I spent uh, two months there in a scout camp, and then well, actually I sold my plane ticket going back to L from Athens to London and uh, hitchhiked from Athens to London. Wow! So that was uh -huh. an amazing thing. Uh huh. I bet. Uh, and you had a lot of adventures. A lot of adventures. adventures. Um, you know, um, it, of course, n nothing dangerous. I uh, did some hiking in the Alps. Um, and I would just, you know, sort of get into a, a place or meet some people and just kind of hang out, which was the wonderful thing about uh, hitchhiking as opposed to um, doing the Euro rail, the, you know, the train system, which many of the college students were doing at that time, you know, where you sort of just, you know, you get a ticket and you just ride the rails and basically it's just a bunch of Americans mm -hmm. and college students, so, you know, you might as well just be home. Uh, you know, I'd meet up, like, for instance, I met up with some people who were, had a farm in Wales, and so I went to work on their sheep farm for a week mm -hmm. in Wales, and I think that it was a, maybe a 400-year-old um, farmhouse mm -hmm. in the Welsh hills, and, um, you know, it was just, just amazing riding around, you know, fixing the fences, helping them, mm -hmm. you know, herd and, and shear the sheep, and, you know, you, you know, usually get that, no, at least not no. this part of the country, oh, wow. you know, maybe out west you do. Mm -hmm. um, so it provided a lot more connection with the locals mm -hmm. and with sort of real life that people were living there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you were working on that uh, in, in your art underground, kind of right, then, sure. you were forming some right, of that, right. mm -hmm. uh, which later has come across in your sure, sculptures. Absolutely. Right. And then um, you returned to the States mm -hmm. 
and you went uh, into business school and you went uh, well, I, uh, graduated business school uh, became a stockbroker stock uh, Wall Street area or and well in Wall Street and then Long Island a deep mm -hmm. discount mm -hmm. brokerage house mm -hmm. um, and then at some point just decided that wasn't for me and I guess the biggest thing was the disconnect between what I was doing from nine to five to what was going on in my head mm -hmm. every day that I would, you know, go to work and do the, the business thing and then come home and sculpt and, you know, study in New York City at the Art Students League um, and be doing some wonderful creative things or going camping on the weekend mm -hmm. and then, you know, back to the office. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it was you know this di difference between your life and the work, and the work that you were doing to me had to connect with your life better. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. you know, if you want to say your life's work, if your work is so far segmented from your life, it doesn't it didn't feel very good from who you are from who you are mm -hmm. right right. Um, and so I quit that job in, I guess it was probably um, the fall of 92, um, went up on a whitewater canoeing shop uh, up in Canada with a uh, scouting group that I belonged to, and then essentially just hitchhiked across the country from there, mm -hmm. did the perimeter of um, Canada and the United States about 10,000 miles or so. You've been quite a hitchhiker in your life, and <laughs> one of your specialties thing. also. Absolutely. Uh, well, it's uh, a good metaphor for life, I'd mm -hmm, say, as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, and so I just spent a lot of time essentially going from national park to national park and spending time, you know, hiking and camping through the parks. So, like, I'd go into um, the Grand Canyon and spend a 10 days hiking on the trails. Mm -hmm. And you know, just and really, sort of off of the tourist areas, um, where I'd be hiking for maybe four or five days without seeing anyone else. Wow. So everything that I had was on my back, everything I needed, um, tent and food and water and entirely everything, mm -hmm. and especially water in the Grand Canyon, because there it's not water. So every, all the water that you have, you have to pack in. Mm -hmm. Well, after for your about life. Um, I don't know two months or so of uh, hiking around the country and going to many different national parks. Um, Some place in Utah I decided that I was going to be a sculptor oh, without where having... Where in Utah? Right? Oh, I don't, probably around Moab. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I hadn't taken any sculpture classes or art classes per se. Um, I just decided that I was going to be a sculptor and came back to New York City, enrolled at the Art Students League and um, signed up for uh, two internships as a sculptor assistant um, and went at it. And that was uh, January 93, and I haven't turned back since. Wow, so you hadn't done any sculpture work prior to that decision in not, Utah? Not really. I had done, again, you know, a handful of, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, Andy Golub, uh that we were talking about earlier, was uh, an old college roommate who was an artist and got me into art in college. Um, and so I, you know, I'd done, you know, one or two little um, sort of sculpture projects and, you know, just kind of playing with it um, and was interested in it, mm -hmm. but never had really done any, you know, formal training. I at one point enrolled in an art class in college and very quickly dropped out because everyone in the class was interested in sort of an easy A. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was just, nobody was serious about it. It was just, you know, kind of tomfoolery. And I'm just like, you know, there's no point in this, you know, I might as well, you know, not do this at all. So I just very quickly dropped out. Mm -hmm. wow. um, so then in early 93, decided I was going to be a sculptor and been sculpting ever since. And did you have any uh, mentors in doing the sculpture? Um, yes, I, I actually I worked with um, a couple of people, Meryl Taradash, who does um, 
very modern kinetic uh, wind-driven sculpture. Um, and Messner, who was well known for um, sort of found material, um, big iron type sculptures, big welded type pieces. Um, and I helped them both in their studios creating those pieces. Um, and another fellow, uh, Alan Cottrell, who I'd actually gone to to work with in Pennsylvania in doing a very large um, sculpture project that he had down there, which was um, 15 twice life-size figures that were was going up the side of a, a building, uh, a world cultures building. And so it was actually each of the figures were charting sort of the progress of humanity from sort of Cro-Magnon man mm -hmm. And the last figure was a female astronaut wow. at the sort of cresting the top of the building. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it was a very, very big project and just, you know, learned a tremendous amount mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, that's really uh, exciting to know that you listen to this other underground part, artist right. part of Absolutely, you. Absolutely, sure. And let it come out and to affect the world, really, mm -hmm. in different right, ways right, with your sure. sculptures now. Mm -hmm. So, um, so then uh, you went on in 93, mm -hmm. and yeah. you made that your full-time work at that point? Yes, well, I had to earn some other money as well in mm -hmm. different ways, from mm -hmm. yeah. de delivering pizzas mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, doing taxes wow. to, you know, different things you mm -hmm. had to do to uh, make ends survive, meet. Survive, right? To make, mm -hmm. to survive until, uh, you know, selling regularly enough. Mm -hmm. um, and but you know that was sort of you know my major life direction from that point mm -hmm. and uh, what, uh, how did your sculptures evolve did you start out with people and well i've always really been doing uh figures and faces and people mm -hmm. i haven't mm -hmm. i one time was in a class where they were uh, we were supposed to draw horses in this field and um, i ended up drawing the people who were drawing the horses because mm -hmm. <laughs> that was more interesting. Mm -hmm. Direction, really, of sculpture. Um, how do you get this point of representing people uh, in a very lifelike and uh, vivid and connecting way to humans? Mm -hmm. You know that they want mm -hmm. to embrace them or they're moved right. uh, emotionally by mm -hmm. looking at them. Uh, right. What uh, what does it for you to get from uh, your idea uh, within um, of how someone looks and then represent it? Right. Uh, you know, again, I'm really obsessed by the human face and the emotions that, you know, sort of play across it, mm -hmm. uh, across the face. And so um, I, you know, th there's a very strong thing for me, and I'm sort of always sculpting the face and the figure. Um, and, you know, studying to a degree where, you know, a very small piece of clay can, you know, make the difference. So, in other words, you're sort of frowning your brows, you know, mm -hmm. looking at me concerned, and, you know, that's very, a very different emotion than, you know, just slightly different when you don't have those little lines in your creases in your forehead. Mm -hmm. And so, um, to understand that, you know, that these muscles called the corrugators, when they're flexed, mean somebody's, you know, thinking and pondering and trying to figure something out. Mm -hmm. And then when you don't see them at all, they're, you know, happy or they're contemplative mm -hmm. without struggling to find something out. And so there's, you know, maybe 30, you know, very powerful muscles in the human face that really play into the psychology. And so you can go from, you know, a slight smile to a slight smile, to a sly smile, that if you saw this on a politician, you'd be like, whoa, watch mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, this ingratiating smile that perhaps a grandfather has, you know, to full out smile and quote unquote, they're smiling with their eyes, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so to be able to capture these specific things um, is, you know, not only very powerful, but is, you know, sort of this psychological power of the human face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like uh, you have a zoom lens on right. that. Well, right. I mean, I'm trying to get a little piece of this and trying to tell the, the story and, and what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, as you 
work with the, the you know the figures and the faces and you know really try to get the nuances you can really um, create some wonderful artwork that that really speaks to people mm -hmm. um, and again sort of going back to the literature my sort of basis where I'm coming from is almost not so much as a visual artist but sort of as a storyteller mm -hmm. and so you know I'm telling the story like let's you know like particularly let's say in this piece called um, you know here it's got an ear and the word uh, here and so you you are combining two or three different elements and really telling a story and having a philosophical discussion on the um, combination of these different things um, and so that you know that's what I'm really about uh, since 93 in the creating of your sculptures um, that uh, you uh, have um, created a number of different uh, representation of uh, people uh, locally sure. uh, local to Hopkinton uh, sure. as well as uh, other countries beyond and uh, your work is all over the world um, I was wondering um, if you're able to speak of a few of uh, where they are, maybe start with Hopkinton, but also mention a few that are out there in the world, maybe that you're especially sure. fond of or have a particular meaning or importance to you. Sure, absolutely. Um, so one of the largest pieces that I'm best known for here in Hopkinton is the um, George Brown sculpture at the start of the Boston Marathon, which is on our common. Um, and so again, you, you know, as you're doing a portrait sculpture, it's not just, you know, a physical thing, but it's also the story of someone's life. So again, it sort of gets back to the story. Um, and I start out portraits by really reading and learning about the people that I'm, or the per person that I'm sculpting. Um, and George Brown was just, you know, an amazing person. He grew up here in Hockington, um, grew up on a farm, um, but he also um, ran the Boston Garden and the arena and really did a lot of amazing things in um, sports um, and bringing sports to people sort of as the first sort of sports entertainment mogul, if you want to say that. Um, and so, you know, through his, um, his family and his legacy really created some things that were um, loved as Bostonians, they, namely the Bruins, um, the Celtics. His son um, ran and managed the Celtics, brought Red Auerbacher to Boston. Um, uh, George Brown bought, brought the start of the Boston Marathon here to Hopkinton. Um, he was involved in the marathon since, I think, uh, the 1898 and 1905 he was the official starter and started the race I think for the next 33 odd years or so until his death um, and you know sort of um, you know went through the depression and went through I guess the first world war um, and could really bring through some very very hard financial times could bring sports to everyday people and you know get them to enjoy it and um, just you know brought a, a, a wonderful sensibility to um, to sporting and, and to Hopkinton with the Boston Marathon. Um, I also did uh, Anwar Sadat which I actually don't have his portrait here and that was for the Sadat family um, I was working with his daughter, uh, Camelia Sadat, and again, you know, talking about sort of the life stories, um, you know, listening to her and all the stories that she told about um, meeting the, uh, you know, American presidents, Ronald Reagan and Gerald Ford and many other people and other world leaders, um, leaders around the world. Um, it, you know, it really just brought to life the, the portrait of Anwar Sadat that I did. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you know, it's, it's the stories that I hear and that I read about as I'm sculpting these pieces that, that bring them to life. Um, 
And I also uh, read on your website that uh, you affect um, political reaction uh, a bit. Uh, I know with one of your sculptures uh, that is in front of a courthouse. And uh, uh, yes, right. Uh, you are getting people to think about important sure. um, topics in life. Right, right. Can you tell sure. a little bit about that one? Uh, that, that particular piece was, uh, it's called Stand Up, Speak Out. Mm -hmm. And it was created with students against drunk driving in, in New York. Um, it was originally, it's a um, sculpture that includes um, three overlay size figures. There's a person that's um, on the ground as if they were hit by a car. You can't really tell what happened. A young woman who's sort of a, a caregiver person. And then an African American a uh, person striding forward with his hands outstretched uh, as if calling for help. And also uh, making, uh, making hope, uh, providing Absolutely, uh, sure. thoughts toward hope uh, with your Holocaust uh, sculpture. Right. And uh, I read about how you uh, left room between um, figures uh, for present and past to consider um, never again to right. Uh, let something as terrible as that happen right, in right. life. That particular piece was called, it's called the um, Children's Holocaust Monument. It, it's in, again, New York. Um, and it shows um, three children um, in period dress as they were leaving um, the transport trains going into one of the concentration mm -hmm. camps. Mm -hmm. um, and this was based on a, um, a photograph um, basically at the, at the end of the Holocaust and then across from them is a, um, a young girl in modern day clothes with a candle reaching out to them. And there's actually a space between the two, the, sort of the past and the future, where a modern day a, a life child can actually hold both their hands and make the physical link between the historical and the contemporary. Um, and, and really seeing our place in a very physical way, our place in the world in not letting this happen mm -hmm. and sort of what our responsibilities are um, as a society and as a culture and to really think that, you know, life doesn't end with us but, you know, we hope that it will, you know, we'll be able to preserve the world and preserve our culture in, um, you know, in a way that we can pass along over time. Mm-hmm.